All right. Well, as Pastor said there, um, Lord laid it on my heart as we're, you know, it's a week away from Christmas um, that to do a Bible study off, off of Mary. And I didn't realize last Sunday he'd be doing a message that was very heavily, I mean, I guess I should have assumed it's Christmas time. It would be doing a message more towards Mary. But I thought it'd be good for tonight just to take a, a, a side step away from the disciples of the list. And uh, move on to another disciple, and that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Mary actually was a disciple of Christ. Uh, even though she was not an apostle, she was not one of the 12 sent ones. That's what apostle means, if you can recall, almost a year ago now, all the way back to our uh, Bible study where the apostles, the word apostle just means sent one. There was someone that was sent out. There were 12 apostles, um, original apostles that were sent out by Christ. Uh, but Jesus had many disciples. He had the original 12 disciples. At one point, he sends out 70 disciples. And, and uh, the, just, the list of disciples just keeps growing. And Mary is, a, is among that list. So I thought it'd be really good just to take a, a little bit of a Christmas special, if you would, and uh, just look at Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. And um, so we won't be using our charts tonight. And, uh, as, but as we've been emphasizing with all the other disciples, uh, is that they were all ordinary men. They were all very normal. They came from very average places, maybe even below average places. They had ordinary jobs. They had families. They had uh, ordinary characteristics. Um, there was really nothing extraordinary about them except for the, what God had empowered them to do and he had given his power to. It's the same with Mary. She was a very normal, ordinary, average woman that God, that God did something extraordinary with. It's all through his power. So that's what we're trying to emphasize here. It wasn't about the people, it was about their God and how God used them with their willingness uh, to be used. And uh, so I think we could see that in Mary. Uh, so if you would go to Luke chapter 1, this evening, Luke chapter 1, and uh, I'll try not to repeat anything Pastor said on, on Sunday, and um, I'm sure maybe this Sunday he's got another few messages prepared for Christmas, but um, in Luke chapter 1, we find in verse number 26, really the kind of the beginning of what is often called the Christmas account. Really, Luke chapter 2 is it, but this is prior to that. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. All right, so that's our character for this evening, uh, Mary. So much has been said about Mary, and uh, unfortunately much wrong has been said about Mary. And uh, obviously from the Roman Catholic Church and, uh, and others, I believe Anglicans kind of hold a similar view as well sometimes, um, Mary has been uplifted, and she's been put on a pedestal to which she doesn't actually belong. And she's been idolized and worshipped and prayed to, and... Uh, all these things that you don't actually find in the Bible, and of course, many of us are aware of that, and that is all wrong, but I think if we're not careful, we can maybe become sympathetic to some of those views and, uh, and, and start getting worn down a little bit and start accepting things that aren't actually biblical at all, and we have to stick with what the Bible says. Uh, but tonight, I don't want to spend too much time debunking all the Roman Catholic errors. And I don't want to spend too much time diving in deep into this to one uh, passage. You know, I don't want to get stuck in Luke 1 or Luke 2. Um, I really just want to give an overall view of Mary's life, not diving into something really specific, uh, not going through and pointing out all the error, but just given what do we know for, for facts from the Bible about Mary and just giving an overall view of her life, not just focusing on the Christmas account, but really all, all the way through her life. And you can kind of put all the pieces together. And most of these things, like all the disciples, we know the little pieces of them. But when you put them all together in one sitting and you, and you kind of form a character, you see a person, not just a name. Uh, that's, that's what I think is, is really good is when you can you know, put it all together and you can see their life really at a glance. That's really what I want to do tonight. Not nitpick anything, you know, like I said, the errors of the Roman Catholic Church, not dive in too like, deep into one passage. It's an overview, overall view. About what we know to be true, because it, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, if you study what's true, you'll be able to identify what's wrong. So if you if you just look at what the Bible says and take that as it says, 
then when you come across the Roman Catholic, you would say, no, 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 this is what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what tr tradition says, what manna says, it doesn't even matter what history has said, with a lot of Christians historically from like the, the th AD 300 and on, is really when the whole Mary thing uh, uh, really sparked and started spreading. Uh, but tonight, just, let's just look at what the Bible says about Mary. Because the truth is, the Bible has a lot of great things to say about Mary. And I think Christians sometimes, either we, like, you go one side of the spectrum where you say too much and make too much of her, and you spill off into the Roman Catholic doctrine, or you're so afraid of that that you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and you don't give her the, the right uh, view that the Scripture actually gives her. The Bible has a lot of great things to say about Mary. And so for our, our, our title this evening for Mary, we're going to actually get it from Luke chapter 1 and verse 43. This is when Elizabeth comes to Mary, and it says in verse 43 of Luke 1, and it says, And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So that's the title we're giving Mary this evening. Mary, the mother of our Lord. Now you have to be careful. The word Lord there is not the word for Jehovah. In the Old Testament, you find capital L-O-R-D, and that's the word Jehovah, that's God. This is not the word Jehovah, this is a, a Greek word, I can't pronounce it right, I'm not, I'm not, I don't speak Greek, but it's something like curios, or it sounds kind of like curious, but it means master, someone who, who holds authority, someone who, who owns control. Uh, so, so, and you find it in a lot of the parables, and that you find someone that was mentioned as a lord, there was someone that owned a lot of things, that had dominion and usually had slaves that's what elizabeth is saying she's not saying you know the mother of my lord the mother of my jehovah of my god she's saying the mother of my master is really what she's saying and we'll, we'll explain that a little bit in a little bit and kind of make more sense but i think it's very important that we get the, the idea here that elizabeth is not saying that mary is the mother of god she's saying she's the mother of her master the one that she reverences and respects there's a big difference uh, but we'll, we'll see what the difference is in, in a little bit. Uh, so, being, like we said, the interesting thing about Mary is that she was a disciple of Christ. So let me prove that to you. In Acts chapter 1, you, you find a list. This is the last time the list of all the names of the disciples is found. This is after Christ has risen and, and, and after Christ has ascended up into heaven. And it says in verse 13, and here's some of our men we've been looking at. And like I said, I hope now you're not just seeing names, you're seeing people, you're seeing their flaws, you're seeing the good things about them, you're seeing how God changed their lives from uh, before Christ to after Christ and used them. It says, and when they were coming, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So we find Mary there is listed with all these people, all the, the, the original 12 disciples, but there's also other women and Jesus' brothers, and then you look in verse 15, it says, In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. And then it goes on and gives a number and said, The number of names together were about 120. So you see how it gives the list of the, the apostles, and then Mary, and the other women, and then his brethren. And then it says, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. All of them were all disciples of Christ. 120 disciples of Christ were all gathered, and Mary was one of those disciples. So Mary was a disciple of Christ. I think that's something very important, that even though she was the mother of Christ, or the mother of Jesus, uh, she was still a follower and a learner of him. I believe even all the way back in Luke 1 and Luke 2, even from the time that she gave birth to Jesus, she was a disciple of him, learning from him. That's why the Bible says that Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She was a learner of Christ, a follower of him. So, she was a, a disciple. Uh, the name Mary has a, a variety of meanings. It has uh, the meaning of beloved. It has the meaning of bitterness. And it has the meaning of wished for child. So, it has a, a variety of meanings. It can either be beloved or bitter, you know. You never know which one you're going to get. 
Um, and then there are six different Marys in the Bible. I think that's very interesting. In the New Testament, you can find six different Marys. And uh, so you can see that there is a very popular name back then. There's a lot of variations of the name Mary. You find Maria and Marie and Miriam. And uh, the, the name Mary is one of the only um, feminine names that also has pronounced masculine names like Mario and Marion. Apparently that's a masculine name there. So Mary has a lot of variation with it, but they all basically mean the same thing, uh, either beloved, bitter, or wished for child. Uh, the, the name Mary is related to the Old Testament, Testament Miriam, uh, or to Mara. You remember the story of Ruth when uh, Naomi was there. They, 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 they called her Naomi. She said, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord has, has dealt very bitterly with me. So the name Mara means bitter. Mary is related. To, you change one letter at the very end, Mary, Mara. Um, and, and so they're very closely related, bitter. Um, also to Mara. Chapter 7. This other said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? See, so they're questioning, Is Christ going to come out of Galilee? They look very down upon Galilee. And then look in, in verse 50. It says, Nicodemus saith unto them, that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? See how they're mocking him there. They say, Nicodemus, are you also one of these guys from Galilee, unlearned, ignorant of, of what's true? And uh, they said, Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. So they looked very disdainly down upon people from Galilee. This is where Mary was from, Galilee, Nazareth, very small, very sinful, very insignificant place. So uh, back in Luke chapter 1 and uh, verse 27 there, it says that Mary was a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, we know that Joseph was a carpenter. So we can make some assumptions about Mary based on that fact. And we can assume that Mary came from a very poor family. She, she couldn't, you know, she married a carpenter, not someone that was very well to do, you know, just uh, someone that earned an honest day's wage, nothing, you know, he wasn't bringing in money, loads of money, so she wasn't a gold digger, you know, she must have uh, married for love instead, you know, um, but, but actually it was, it probably was an arranged marriage uh, back back then, this is what, what they would do, it would be an arranged marriage uh, long before uh, they, they even came to age, usually espousals were, were, were brought forth, usually when the girl was, I think, about 13 or 14, so very, very, very young. 
Um, but so we can see that because she was uh, espoused to a carpenter, she probably didn't have a lot of money. She, her family didn't have a lot of money. Uh, she probably wasn't the most attractive woman. Isaiah chapter 53, uh, I'll just turn there and, and read it to you. Isaiah 53, it says of Jesus, of Christ, in verse 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And we sh when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So it says when Christ comes, there would be no beauty, not, nothing attractive about him. Not, like you could see that would attract. So it's possible, most likely, that Jesus got that ugliness from his mother. So maybe Mary wasn't actually very attractive. Maybe that's where she got the, the, that there would be no beauty. Now, I say that half joking and half serious, you know, like, you know, some of you aren't very pleased with how you look when you look in the mirror. You're not very happy with how ugly you are. Well, just blame your parents, okay? Uh, but, you know, it could be because everything that was godly, Christ got from God. Everything that was human, Christ got from Mary. So if there was no, if the Bible says in Isaiah, there was no beauty in him that we would desire him. He must have got that from Mary. Just saying. So that's something we could we could possibly learn from uh, from about Mary. She may not have been much to look at. Um, we know that Mary had at least one sister in John chapter 19. We won't look at it right now. We'll look at it a little bit, little bit later. But John chapter 19, verse 25 says that Mary had a sister uh, beside her at the cross. So Mary, Mary, obviously, she had a father, she had a, a mother, and she had at least one sibling, and that was a sister. Uh, she also had at least one cousin that we know for sure. And in Luke chapter 1 here, it says in verse number uh, 36, the angel says to Mary, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. So Mary had a cousin. Now her cousin ends up having a son named John the Baptist. So eventually she had a nephew. So you, you can see that Mary, she had extended family. And then in, in Luke chapter one as well, when it's talking to uh, about Elizabeth in verse 57, it says, now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered and she brought forth a son. This is John the Baptist being born. Verse 58 says, and her neighbors and her cousins Heard how the Lord had shown great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. So Mary had one cousin, Elizabeth, that we know of. Elizabeth had cousins as well. So that's like Mary's second and third cousins once and twice removed, all those things. So Mary had a very big extended family. If she had cousins, that means she must have had aunts and uncles and so on and so forth. So you can see she, she had family around her. Um, so, so just some interesting things that we know uh, for sure about uh, Mary there, about her family. So it says that um, Mary was espoused to, to a man whose name was Joseph. As I said, he was a carpenter. Uh, the, the espousal period would normally last a number of months. And I was saying to Jen, there you go, there's proof that long engagements are biblical, all right? Uh, espousals were about, it's a little bit um, more, so the way I picture it is if you have a marriage here, and, and today we have engagements, and a spousal was like kind of in the middle. It was, it was in others' eyes, you had already signed the contracts, you were already man and wife, you just hadn't consummated the marriage uh, physically yet. So, it, but you know, by all rights, they were married. If they wanted to break off the espousal, they had to have a writing of divorcement, and they had to have at least two witnesses. Uh, that would be there to witness the divorcement. So when, when Joseph said, you know, the Bible says he was minded to put her away privately or privily, privately, he was thinking, I'm going to have to find some, somewhere inconspicuous. I'll have to find two people that will just happily sign off that won't spread the word. You know, he's already putting these things in mind. Uh, you, that's what an espousal was. You had, it was basically a marriage. They just hadn't actually come together yet uh, as a, an actual physical man and wife. They hadn't become one flesh. Uh, yet. So that, that was an espousal, and, and Mary was espoused, or basically like engaged uh, to Joseph there. All right, so, so, so far, looking at Mary, there's really nothing outstanding about her life. She was, she was a virgin. She was espoused to a carpenter, a very average man, uh, not a very wealthy man. She had, you know, a mother, a father, a sister. She had cousins and aunts and uncles. 
She was from a very normal place, Nazareth in Galilee. Um, so there's nothing really that stands out about her. But if, if Christ hadn't come, if God hadn't come upon her and done something in her life, she would have just lived a very normal, average life. There was nothing significant or special about her. But then God, when he came, and he did a miraculous work in her life, and that was why, why we're reading about her today. It was because of what God did. That's the thing with the Roman Catholics. They make the mistake of they praise Mary more than they praise God. And that's, that's it. Mary would not be where she was. She would not have done what she was. She would not be written in the pages of Scripture if it wasn't for God. And that, and that's the truth of it. So just uh, briefly, I just want to look at just a few things here about uh, marriage to kind of highlight a few things out of out of what we know from the scripture. First of all, let's look at Mary's selection. Mary's selection. So, so think about this. In 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 all of Israel at this time, uh, God could have chosen any maiden that He wanted to. Yet He chose Mary. The Bible says in Isaiah seven, you know, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son. He could have chosen any number of virgins, but for some reason, he chose Mary specifically. I think there was a reason for that, and we'll look at why I think there was a reason for that. But, you know, she, she, was, she was humble. She was really like a peasant, nothing very significant about her. Um, she was very gentle and, and lowly. But you see, that, that was what God was looking for, someone who was meek and quiet and he wasn't looking to go into Jerusalem and find the most qualified and learned person. He was looking for someone who wasn't learned, someone that um, had, had, had a heart that would be willing to obey and submit, not a heart that was already built up in pride and thought it understood everything. I mean, you think about if, if, if God had gone to maybe one of the Pharisees uh, uh, espoused virgins or someone closely related to, to, to them in, in uh, Jerusalem, you know, what would their response have been to, to the angel saying, you know, you're going to bring forth the son? You know, so, so you can see that Mary, her selection seems kind of a, not exactly what we would select if we we're looking for someone to bring forth Christ into this world. Someone from Nazareth, someone from Galilee. We would think of we'd, the first place we'd start looking is in Jerusalem, right? Towards, what, you know, towards Bethlehem, where it was prophesied he was going to come forth. We would never say, let's go to Nazareth, and we'll see in a few years or a couple months, nine months from now, that um, eventually she's going to be in Bethlehem. And just so happened, while she's in Bethlehem there, she's going to have a baby and fulfill the prophecy. You know, so that's not, not necessarily who we would have chosen, but God chose her uh, for a very specific reason. But I think that one of the biggest reasons why God selected Mary for being the mother of, of Christ was because she was very common and very humble and, and not a very uh, well-known person because those were the kind of people that Christ was going to reach. He was going to not reach those. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And when Christ was born into this world, some those that were closest to him that he was surrounded by were the sinners, not the righteous. So maybe God chose Mary just because of her commonness, her a very ordinariness, if that's even a word. So, so uh, her selection. So then we see, the secondly, Mary's superiority. Mary's superiority. Her selection was not random. There was a specific reason for it. And one of those reasons was that she was of low estate. She was inferior. But I think another reason was that in other ways, she was superior. And uh, I'll, I'll explain that in just, a, in just a minute. But let's go ahead and read a few verses here in, in Luke chapter 1. It says in, in verse 28, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. We won't spend too long on this, because Pastor preached a lot about this, uh, you know, being highly favored and favored with God on, on Sunday evening. So if you haven't, uh, if you want to look more into that, look at Pastor's sermon uh, there on YouTube. I think it was called All This Was Done from, from Matthew chapter 1. But we see there that it says that she was highly favored of the Lord. She was superior. Uh, she in, in, in uh, verse um, 20 or 30 there, it says she has found favor with God. 
And in verse 28, at the end, it says, blessed art thou among women. Now, now you have to be careful there because a lot of a lot of Bibles will change it to blessed art thou above women. She was not blessed above women. She wasn't, you know, a step above humanity. She was a human. She was still in the category of women. But she was blessed among them. Pastor, again, did a great job explaining all that uh, on Sunday. But we have to notice the word here because this is a word that gets used and abused a lot uh, with religion. That's the first word that the angel says to Mary. That's the word hail. Hail. Now, I don't know why, but I've never really looked at this word. And I've always just assumed, you know, that the, the angel was uplifting Mary. And he was, in, in a sense, you know, worshiping her and down on his hands and feet. And, you know, all hail. But that's not, a, that's not at all what, what the word hail actually means. I, I encourage you sometime to do a study of the word in, in the Bible. And you'll find usually the word hail is used negatively or by someone negatively. The first word that um, Judas Iscariot came when he came to Jesus and was betraying him in the garden. He said, hail master, and kissed him on the cheek. Um, when they crucified Jesus, what did they say? All hail king of the Jews, mocking him. The only time that Christ used the word hail is when he was when he uh, was resurrected and he met the disciples and he said, all hail. And it says that they all came and bowed at his, at, at his feet. So I think it's in Matthew 28. Uh, that was the only time that Christ used the word. So the Bible very rarely uses the word hail, but it's not, it, was, it wasn't something to, to uplift, to, to, to glorify. Christ wasn't glorifying and worshiping his disciples when he said all hail. The word hail is just a, a salutation. It's a greeting. And you look at it at its meaning, it means, it means literally just be in good health. I'm wishing you to be well. I want you to be well. It's like in, in England, we usually say, we just have a one word greeting. We say, all right. You know, you all the time, you, you hear that walk around, all right. And what, I mean, they don't, it doesn't really mean anything. They don't care if you're all right or not. They just, that's all they say. But, it, you know, you're basically asking, are you all right? Are all things well with you? And th that's basically the same thing as the word hail. Be well, be in good health. And that's what the angel was saying when he says, hail. He wasn't lifting her up. He wasn't worshiping her by any stretch of the means. He was just saying, be in good health, Mary. That's what the word hail means. Because this is important because usually you hear the, the uh, hail Mary prayer by the Catholics. You know, hail Mary, uh, mother of God, or however it goes. I wasn't raised a Catholic, so I don't know. Pastor could probably tell, tell you better than I could. But hail Mary. All they're saying is, be in good health, Mary. Uh, and she's not going to be in good health because she's dead. You can't be in much worse health than being dead, can you? So uh, the Hail Mary is, 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 you know, is completely a bunch of rubbish because you're telling a dead person to be in good health is, is, what, is what it is. So the word hail, is, again, is used, abused, and the meaning has been, has been uh, wrongly applied to it to, to mean a word of worship. And all it is is just a, a salutation, a greeting to say be in good health. And I hope all is well with you. Uh, so Mary, she wasn't God. She wasn't the mother of God, as we saw, as we looked at a, a little bit ago, when we looked at when Elizabeth said, the mother of my Lord. She was saying the mother of my master, not the mother of my Jehovah. That wasn't what she was saying. Now, Jesus Christ was Jehovah. He was God. And he was the son of God. But Mary didn't give him that deity. Mary didn't give him that uh, godliness. Every, like we said, everything that was godly about Christ came from God, the Holy Spirit. Everything that was human about Christ came from Mary uh, as a human. So the, the prayer, Hail Mary, Mother of God, uh, that, that never, the, the Bible never says that Mary was the mother of God. It says she was the mother of Jesus. It never says the mother of Jehovah, and it never says the mother of Christ even. Because Jehovah speaks to his deity, that's his, that's his uh, that's his heavenly name. Christ speaks of his prophetical name. Jesus is his earthly name. She was the, the mother of Jesus, the, the man, not the God, the man. Now, she, now she, Jesus, again, he was both fully God and fully man, but the godliness was, should be attributed to God, the Holy Spirit, not to Mary. All that Mary gave him was his body. The human flesh that he carried on his on his back. Uh, that was that was that, that is what Mary had. So she was she was superior. We're, we're saying Mary was superior. 
Why was she superior? She was superior for a few reasons to all the other women. First of all, she was superior because of her virginity. Isaiah 7 said that a virgin shall conceive. That meant that anybody that was not a virgin, I mean, no men, because um, they can't conceive and bear, bear a son. And that meant any woman that had been with a man because they weren't a virgin. It had to be a virgin. So that narrows it down a little bit. She was superior for that reason. She was superior because of her lineage. It couldn't just be any woman in, in uh, Israel at this time. It said that they had to be through the line of David, had to be through the line of Judah. Um, and, and so Mary's lineage was through David. We don't take the time to look at the lineages. You can read about them in Matthew 1, Luke, Luke 3, Jesus' lineages. Um, but you can trace it back to David. Uh, and Mary was superior because of her lineage. She had a godly lineage. And lastly, I believe she was superior because of her character. Her character. Now, she, she had her times where she doubted. She was sinful. She had sinful flesh. She, as we'll see in just a little bit, she was skeptical. But she still had a great character about her. She, was, she had some great qualities in her life that I believe God wanted in a woman, in the mother that was going to give birth and raise the Son of God. So I think Mary was superior because of her character, because of her heart. So we have to um, see that Mary, Mary was superior. Next, we're going to see that Mary, we're going to see Mary's skepticism. Mary was skeptical. In, in Luke chapter 1, verse 29, it says, And when she saw him, this is the angel, it says, She was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Mary was doubting, you know, what in the world is going on? In uh, verse number 42, uh, I think that's the wrong one, uh, 32. Uh, no, that's wrong as well. 34, excuse me. 34, it says, then, Mary, uh, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not man? Her first reaction to the angel's words was not belief. It wasn't, oh, it's about time, I deserve this. It was doubt. It was skepticism. How is this going to be? And then we get the words from the angel in verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. But we see Mary was skeptical. She didn't just instantly believe. She, she had doubts. She didn't see how in the world this is going to happen. You know, some people think that Mary was just so perfect and, you know, just immediately went along with, with everything that God was wanting to do. But no, she stopped and she questioned, how shall this be? I don't even know a man. So her, her first reaction to the angel's word was doubt. At a recent uh, conference on world religions, um, there was uh, many religions that obviously opposed Christianity, and they said that we could all be in unity if Christians would just give up two doctrines. The first was the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. What do you think the second was? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those two doctrines. If Christians were just to get rid of the virgin birth and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all the religions could all join hands and we could all be together. The virgin birth is very important. You know, oftentimes we just glance over and we, and we don't even think about the, the miracle that it was, how miraculous it was. Women don't just have babies without, you know, without being with a man. This is supernatural. And Mary was skeptical at it at first. But we believe in a God that's all powerful. Like, like the angel says here, for God, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And that was the lesson Mary had to learn with her skepticism. That God can do anything. Nothing with God is impossible. Next, we see Mary's submission in verse number 48. This is Mary's prayer, her, her praise, really, of, of what has just been revealed to her. And it says in verse 46, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden, for behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. Actually, back on back up to verse 38. I believe I wrote down the word, wrong verses there. 38. It says, And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Verse 38, we find Mary's submission. She submitted. Now, notice that she had not yet conceived. In verse um, number um, 
31, it says, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. That's future tense. You're going to and bring forth a son. He shall. This is all future tense. And then Mary says in verse 34, how shall this be? How is this going to be? Not how it has this happened. How is this going to happen? It's all future tense. And the Holy Ghost in verse 35 says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon me. See, these are all promises for the future. But the Lord had not yet gone against Mary's will and forced something upon her. It was He was offering an opportunity to her. You know, she she didn't she you know this wasn't like pastors talked a lot about recently. This wasn't the unconditional election where you're going to have to do this. And you have no choice in the matter. You can't say no. Here you go. She had a choice because in verse 38 she says, "Be it unto me according to thy word." She chose to have this done. The Lord offered this opportunity to her, and she said, "Whatever the Lord wills, that's what I want." And so she submitted to what the Lord wanted. You know, we all, we all, as Christians, we all need a desire to submit to what the Lord wants. The Bible says that, that women, that wives, should submit unto their own husbands. It also says that, it says, yea, all of you, we are to all submit unto the mighty hand of God. So submission is a very important uh, quality in the Christian life. It's a very important uh, characteristic that we should develop, the idea of submission, uh, submitting to the Lord, submitting to others. Submitting to leadership that is above us. And especially for a woman, especially for a mother, it was very important that Mary had a submissive heart. I think that's another reason why she was superior, because she was willing. She was willing to do all that the Lord wanted. She was submissive. Next, we see Mary's Savior. Mary's Savior. And we just read a little bit ago, but in verse 47 of Luke 1, it says, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior, my Savior. So this is a, a great verse to use with Roman Catholics or anyone that believes that Mary, that we ought to pray to Mary or Mary is going to help us get to heaven. It says that Mary had a Savior. Mary needed a Savior. She had to place her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's why in Acts 1, why do you think she's there? In Acts 1, we'll look at it in just a little bit. Was Mary there so that, you know, okay, guys, his show's over. It's my turn now. You're all to pray to me. You're all to bow to me. I'm the new Savior now. No, she was found with the other disciples when Peter stands up and starts preaching about Christ. And she listened to that because she was trusting in Jesus Christ for her salvation. Her son, yes, but he was her Savior. And she realized that. And you, if you read on this, this prayer, you find that Mary had a great understanding of, of the Old Testament. And in verse uh, 54, it says, He hath hope in his servant Israel, remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. So Mary there, she's talking about the Old Testament. She knew the Bible pretty well. She probably raised her children on, on the Old Testament, on, on the scriptures, and taught them things. Um, but she, one thing she knew was that she needed a Savior, and her Savior was her son eventually. So next we see Mary's sorrow in Luke chapter number 2. Uh, as I, I referenced this earlier, this is after Christ had been born, uh, after uh, the angels had appeared, after the shepherds had come, after all of that. It says that there was a man named Simeon, you can find in verse 25, it says, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose, whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. This man was Simeon, and later on in, in, in this passage, in verse uh, 34, it said, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in, Jeruz in Israel, excuse me. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. And then he says in this little parenthetical statement, Yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon said to Mary, he said, A sword is going to pierce through your own soul. Now there's a lot of speculation exactly what that means. Most believe and teach that's 
that was at the, the foot of the cross when Mary was standing there watching Christ die, that the sword was piercing through her soul, and that was Mary's great sorrow. I, can, I, can, I believe that, yes, but I also believe that, that sorrow was really a whole part of Mary's life. I mean, you think about it, Mary was um, looked down upon. She was probably called a liar for saying, you know, she had, was having a child but never knew a man. Uh, she was probably called an adulterer. People probably whispered behind her back. Um, so all, kind of, all throughout her life, she was acquainted with sorrow. Uh, obviously, Joseph kind of disappears off the, the scene. So we, we assume that Joseph probably died. So Mary eventually became a widow. So she had sorrow in that and loss. And eventually, at the, at the foot of the cross, she finds sorrow when, when she sees Christ, her, her son and her savior. Uh, perish there on the cross. So Mary uh, had a lot of sorrow, a lot of bitterness uh, in her life. And if we go over to Mark chapter 3, we find an account here that seems a little bit strange, but I think it kind of shows us a little bit of some of the struggles that Mary uh, went through um, with raising Christ and even and after Christ had, had left home and began his ministry. In Luke chapter 21, it says, and when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. So this is after, the, funny enough, this is right after the list of, of the 12 disciples in verse 13 on. But it says, when Christ's friends heard of this, you know, he's starting this ministry. In their eyes, he's starting a cult. He's getting men together that are going to follow him. They're going to do a lot of great things. And they, it says, when his friends heard of it, they went out to lay hold on him, but they said, he's beside himself. You're mad. You lost your mind. Later on in this passage, look in verse 31. It says, there came then his brethren, that's his brothers, and his mother. And standing without, sent unto him, calling him. So Mary comes to Christ. They've heard about the madness that he's doing. He's, you know, getting this group of men. He's getting his, his posse together. Don't know what he's going to do. She's, she's probably, you know concerned about him, worried he's not making the right decisions, all of this. And she goes and stands without, and they called unto him. And it says, and the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brother? And he looked round about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister, and mother. Think about how hard that would have been for Mary to hear her son. I mean, she, she had to understand that, you know, this was, he was ultimately the son of God. He was God that was from the foundation of the world. In fact, Jesus Christ, this is kind of, you know, a backwards way of saying it, but Jesus Christ created the world. He created Mary. He created the womb that was going to carry him into this world. Kind of, a, kind of a, an amazing thing about it. Think about how, how hard it would have been to Mary to hear that Christ, in a sense, was, was separating himself from her, saying, you know, you, you are my family, my earthly family, but I'm not concerned about my earthly family. I'm worried about my spiritual family, the ones that are going to be in heaven. Whosoever doeth the will of my father, the same as my, my mother and my sisters and my brethren. That would have been hard for Mary to accept, to have to realize that, you know, her son that she had raised, and we don't hear a lot about Christ before he turns 30 years old, but uh, in Luke 2, it says that Jesus was subject unto his parents. For 30-odd for years, Jesus Christ was raised by Mary. She, she taught him how to walk. She taught him probably how to speak. I mean, maybe he came out of the womb speaking because he was a son of God, I don't know, but most likely she had to teach him these things. She had to raise him. She had to feed him. He would have been there for all this, you know, his first moments that, that children go through. And then all of a sudden, it came to a point where he stepped out, and he was more concerned about his father's business, and she had to accept that, to come to an understanding that Christ was no longer in her hands, Christ was in the father's hands, and there was nothing she could do about it. I think Mary went through a lot of sorrow, a lot of bitterness about that. It would have been a struggle for her. In fact, Christ's first miracle in John chapter, three, uh, chapter 2 uh, Christ's very first miracle was changing the water into wine. Do you remember who was the one that, that came to Jesus and said they have no wine? It was Mary. 
In Luke chapter 2, it says in verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus never referred to Mary as mother. He only referred to her as woman. Now, he wasn't trying to disrespect her by any means. I don't encourage you to call your mother woman. <laughs> Usually, just call your mother woman if you're in an argument or something like that, right? He wasn't disrespecting her. He was just trying to help her realize her place. She was still a sinner. He was the son of God. And he called her, he called her woman. And uh, so I think she struggled at times, really in a sense, letting her son go. And she probably wondered what was the sword going to be. She knew something probably bad was going to happen, something painful was going to happen in the future. She didn't really know exactly what would happen. But I think she, she probably struggled and thought about these things and went through a lot of sorrow. Then finally, in John chapter 19, at, we find her at the foot of the cross where the sword uh, finally pierces through her soul. It says in verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the, the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. So Mary there, she was watching her son die. She was watching her Savior die. And I believe she was very sorrowful. And Jesus, I think it's amazing, some of his last moments on earth, he took the time to care for his mother. He took the, the Bible says of Hezekiah, when he was going to die, the angel came, or the prophet came to him and said, set thine house in order. I think this is Christ. I mean, he didn't have much of a family, but he, he set what little bit of his house that he had in order. He, he made sure that his mother was going to be taken care of. And uh, so... But notice what it says about Mary here. It says in verse 25, now there stood by the cross, Mary. She was standing. She wasn't down on her face, weeping and wailing. She wasn't, um, you know, down on her hands and knees, pleading with a guard. She was standing. And this leads us, to, leads us to our last point this evening about Mary, and that was Mary's steadfastness. Her steadfastness, that she was one who stood she stood for the things of Christ. And we find that in Acts chapter 1, as we read earlier, that Mary was there with the other disciples after Christ had risen from the grave, after Christ had ascended. In verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And I believe, because it says in verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. It doesn't say who, but I believe it's probably the same group of people that was in chapter 1. I believe Mary was there at Pentecost and saw the Holy Ghost come down and, uh, and like, insult the, the, uh, the cloven tongues of, like as a fire. I think, I think Mary was there for that. I think Mary continued all that she could do for Christ after this fact. She was steadfast. For the Lord. You know, and, and, and isn't it amazing? You know, 33 years earlier, when, when Christ was before Christ was even born, 33 years or earlier, Mary was there and she said, How shall this be? She was just a young virgin. She hadn't seen all the things that would become of Christ. She hadn't seen all the things that Christ would do. She said, How shall this be? I think the Mary and Acts was probably thinking back and laughing at herself back then, seeing all the things that God had done. And was looking with anticipation for all the things God was going to do uh, now that uh, Christ had died and had risen uh, from the dead. And she realized that nothing was impossible with God. So Mary, Mary was steadfast. I believe Mary uh, raised her children to, to serve the Lord. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 19, it says that when Paul was in Jerusalem, that he saw Peter, and he spent, I think, 15 days with Peter. And then he says, and of the other disciples saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. So we find one of Christ's brother, well, half-brothers, it would have been the same mother, but um, not the same father, because Jesus Christ had no father. He uh, was conceived of the Holy Ghost and Mary, but James would have been conceived of Joseph and of Mary. So his half-brother, 
And I think Mary probably raised James to serve the Lord. James, I did serve the Lord. And um, just one, one more note to say about Mary was that, that she would, she did have children. You know, the, the, the Catholic Church teaches the perpetual virginity of Mary, that she was always a virgin. She never had children. And uh, in, in um, I believe this book of uh, uh, Matthew, yes, Matthew chapter 13. We'll just look at it just very, very quickly. Matthew chapter 13. We find a list of, of, of Jesus' half-sisters and half-brothers. And it says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55 and 56, it says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joses and Simon and Judas? Now what they say, they say that the word brethren there is used same as, as cousin. And I actually taught this, the very the introduction message, remember. Um, but the Lord's taught me a few things since then. I don't believe that is the same word that you would use interchangeably for cousin, because as we saw in Luke chapter 1, the Bible has a word for cousin, Elizabeth by cousin. So I believe if these were Jesus' cousins, they would have said his cousins were here. But it says his brethren, and it gives their names. Then in verse 56, and his sisters. So this is his brothers and sisters. Jesus had, Christ had brothers and sisters. Mary was not a perpetual virgin. One more, one, one more thought is in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, it says that she brought forth her firstborn son. Her firstborn means that this was the first of many. The Bible says in John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God only had one son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't say that he brought forth, that God gave his firstborn son, it says his only begotten son. It doesn't say that Mary brought forth her only son, so it's just her firstborn son. Just a few thoughts there, just to kind of clear up anything uh, that you might be faced with, with the Catholic Church uh, from that. So we don't know anything of Mary's life after Acts 1. We don't know anything of Mary's death. Um, the Catholic Church teaches that Mary's soul and her body were both descended up into heaven by Christ. It's, it's heresy. There's no scriptural basis for that teaching. Uh, most likely what happened to Mary is that she spent the rest of her days serving the Lord, doing what she could, she could and probably died in John's house because that's where, where uh, Christ sent her to was to live with John. And most uh, traditionalists say, most traditions say that John stayed at home and cared for Mary until she died. And then John went out and did his missionary work. Um, so, so that was Mary. Uh, that's what the Bible says about Mary. We looked at all the, well, aside from the parallel accounts, we looked at basically all the uh, events that happened with Mary there. And uh, as you can see, there's nothing supernatural about her except for what God did in her life. There was nothing special about her. She was average. She was normal. Uh, but she had some great uh, qualities in her life that I think God was looking for. But I think the best lesson we can learn from Mary is that at the very beginning, she doubted. She said, how shall this be? And as we come to the end of this year, the, the beginning of a new year, you know, and maybe we have that question in our minds. How shall this be? How, you know, how... We have a couple days left. How are we going to reach? We still have 15 more souls to reach with the gospel and add to the church. How shall this be? Our next year, we're thinking, you know, how are we going to get a church? How is this going to happen? Like the angel said to, to Mary, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And I think Mary learned that lesson. And that is why Mary carried on serving God. She was with the apostles in Acts, carried on being steadfast for the Lord because she knew that God could do all things. Uh, with his power. It wasn't about her. It wasn't about the men she was around. It's about God. I think that's what we can learn from Mary, the mother of the Lord. So just a little bit of a different study tonight related to the disciples, because she was a disciple. She's mentioned with the rest of the disciples in Acts 1. Um, but uh, next time, hopefully in January, the end of January, we'll carry up or carry, pick back up the uh, disciples. I believe we're on James uh, the Less, the son of Alphaeus. And uh, I'm excited about that. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for your word. Lord, I know there's a lot in here tonight because your Bible says a lot about Mary. I pray that it was all truth this evening and uh, nothing based on tradition or man's words or, or even a secular history, Father, but just based off of your word. I pray that you'll use these things in our hearts, Lord. Help us to be 
submissive. Help us to be steadfast for you. Um, help us just to be claiming your promises from your word, Lord, and uh, just so you can do a mighty work in our lives. And we thank you for these things, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.